If you would keep me waiting, I would wait a lifetime In tricky situations, I will be a lifeline Nobody's meant to be fighting alone That's why I'm taking you home I never felt something like this before, I know Keep coming back for your time after time Maybe I'm losing my mind But I know I'll never leave you behind, no Baby, I got you When you feel like falling I'll be there to prove Yeah That baby, I got you No matter the distance No matter the rules Yeah Baby, I got you When you feel like falling I'll be there to prove Yeah That baby, I got you No matter the distance No matter the rules Yeah Baby, I got you Welcome to today's podcast, Pinch Punch, first day of the month. It is November 1st and it is also my birthday. 33 and feeling free. Thank you so much to all of you for your continued support. Thank you to my friends and family for your support also. It has been an insane year. I started in Portugal and then I went to Tbilisi, Georgia and then I was in Turkey and then I was in Malaysia and now I'm in Bali. It's incredible where life can take you if you just take a chance, take a leap and my, you know, words of wisdom to you all after 33 years is be brave enough to see what's on the other side of fear. Also, as always, thank you all not just for your time but also your donations that help keep this channel running and even though I wasn't able to do a podcast the last couple of days, Miss Dorothy Ross and also Leisha C., um, you both sent me donations, so thank you very much, appreciate it, and thank you um, to all of the members and everyone that donates um, during podcasts, and also the moderators for all of the work that you do. So while I'm grateful that I do get to travel while doing this podcast, obviously we have been having internet issues the last few days. I moved apartment and the new apartment that I'm in, even though they advertised that the internet was good, it has not been at all. StreamYard is quite a heavy program and actually they advise that you use an internet cable and I don't have access to one in the room that I'm in. And so... Instead, for the time being, I will be switching to this new format of doing podcasts which are pre-recorded and then premiered as lives. So please do bear with me. I think this is going to be the best way of doing things anytime I'm in a situation where 
the internet isn't fantastic and I think it's just the best way of getting podcasts out to you. So let's get to it, shall we? First, a blast from the past. If you saw the Netflix documentary, and you absolutely should have, because if you didn't, are you really a squaddy? These are some pictures from the Netflix documentary showing Harry, Meghan, Eugenie, and some friends on Halloween. I took this from the Duchess of Sussex Instagram page. If you're not following her, make sure you are. She now has more followers than the Sun newspaper. Shout out to the squad. We are doing it and doing it well. So... These Halloween memories, it says, as it's Halloween, I thought it would be a great time to reminisce. In the debut episode of their Netflix docuseries, Harry and Meghan reflected on Halloween 2016, one of their last private nights before the relationship became public. They recalled how, in late October of that year, the palace communications secretary informed Harry of an imminent story about their relationship. Faced with this revelation, Harry said they decided to pull the pin on the fun grenade and enjoy one last carefree night out incognito joined by princess eugenie and her husband jack they attended an apocalypse themed party in toronto to enjoy one last night of anonymity before the news broke fast forward to 2021 and the sussexes celebrated halloween with both of their kids megan explained we really wanted to make it fun for the kids but they weren't really into it Archie barely wore his dinosaur costume for a few minutes and Lilibet dressed up as a skunk resembling flower from Bambi. I think what I love about these photographs is it really just shows a group of people just having a normal Halloween night. And if you didn't know that this was Harry, Meghan and and their friends, you would just think this, this was just like a bunch of normal people. And I think that this is partly um, the issue that the monarchy has is that they are trying to still uphold this, um, you know, monarchy mystique. And, you know, they're still hanging on to the Mary Poppins cosplay and all of this stuff. And the fact of the matter is, is that we're in the modern era now. And, you know, that that illusion of monarchy, on the one hand, I think they want to carry it on because it also plays into this illusion of power but at a time when I think you need to be more relatable um, it just doesn't work anymore and this is more relatable this is more um, you know imagery that people can see themselves in and relate to. And contrary to what I think the courtiers, the vipers in grey suits in the palace might think, Actually, I think that this is the new soft power, being relatable, not being so closed off that people can't really relate to you at all. And it actually just comes across like you're these very privileged people in, you know, their ivory towers. And that's basically what you had at the coronation. You know, we're spending all of this money while, you know, normal (laughs) working class people who are on the streets are struggling to pay their bills. And I think that the palace should have learnt from um, Harry and Meghan. And I say should have because I think any chance to rehabilitate their image now is now absolutely gone. Okay, on to some good news. Prince Harry has now been appointed to African Park's Board of Directors. The prince, who has worked with the charity for the last seven years, has been part of conservation projects across the continent. Prince Harry's love for wildlife and the environment is no secret, and now the Duke of Sussex's passion has been marked by the charity African Parks, who have appointed him to its board of directors. The prince who has worked with the charity for the last seven years has been part of the conservation projects across the continent and previously became president of the organisation in 2017. His relationship with the charity began in 2016 when he joined the team on a trip to Malawi to undertake an elephant conservation project During his time as president, the Duke of Sussex has also overseen other programs to protect national parks and wildlife in countries across Africa. Fantastic. So congratulations to Harry, another star on his CV. In other great news, fantastic news actually, the Murdoch press is getting a battering. Byline Times has been just killing it. 
They are now in 1,500 outlets across the UK, and I am so sure that that is going to expand. Well done, everyone that went and got your print copies. If you can't get a print copy in store, you can buy a print version also online and also buy their online version. But it would be great, actually, to, su to support their physical paper. Um, I think that, you know, printed paper could make a comeback. Um, if we support an outlet like this, because they're really doing the work that the media should be doing. Um, and they've also taken out a lot of ad space. They had their paper on taxis that were going through London. And I actually saw a video of um, people with the byline paper getting out of taxis, you know, with the byline ads throughout London. That was really funny. And they've also had this screen on wheels being driven through London and they actually went straight to the Murdoch um, headquarters, News International. I think that since Murdoch has stepped down, um, it's given a little bit more room, I think, for people to speak their minds and I hope more people and more outlets um, push back against the Murdoch machine and the Rothermere machine also because the amount of damage that it has done and continues to do and the faces on the screen are some of the minions that keep that Murdoch machine churning. At the bottom there you see the men in grey as Diana used to call them, the vipers in grey suits, Edward Young, William Peel and Clive Alderton. I think it must be an absolute shock for those three men and the men in the palace who were here in the Diana days, especially the older ones. And for them, all they've ever known is a world where they can use the press to pull strings. But the power of mainstream press is getting weaker. Social media has taken over and it's very, very difficult now to control the narrative. You know, when Prince of Pegging starts trending, what do you do? And between the others, Charles, William, Dan Wooten, Simon Case, Jason Off, and Christiane Jones, um, a really dark web seems to be unraveling. And shout out to Byline Times again for all the work that, you know, they've been doing because nobody else seems to be doing it. Nobody else seems to be um, as brave. But hopefully this will inspire other outlets to start talking as well. I mean, Peter Jukes, who's one of the guys at Bylines, he actually tweeted, even the Murdoch press is covering um, the Bylines story. And this is the New York Post. The New York Post is a Murdoch outlet, but they were covering this as well. And I've said before, and I'll keep saying it because I know I'm right, when it becomes more profitable to throw the other royals under the bus, than it is to protect them, the press will do that. Because at the end of the day, they don't care about anything other than their bottom line. The royals don't really have the prestige that they used to. So it's going to be interesting to see how the press behave going forward as the curtain slowly begins to be peeled back. But one of the most important things, of course, about what Byline Times is doing is press accountability especially of the British press, the absolute worst of the worst, the, the tabloid press, right? Um, and even UK outlets that claim not to be, you know, tabloid in the way that the Daily Fail or the Sun are, they still behave very much like tabloids. Case in point, the Daily Telegraph, which is one of the ones that, you know, puts a little bit more of a posh spin on their stories, but they're just as bad as the sun and the daily fell, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they just have a different aesthetic, but the vibe is, is the same. And this is what they posted. This is what they had the audacity to post. Rest in peace, Matthew Perry. Um, you deserve so much more respect than the disrespects that the Telegraph um, posted. So obviously, Matthew Perry sadly passed away. And they posted how Matthew Perry became the friend who never quite seemed to get it together. Now, Matthew Perry spoke openly about his addiction issues and his mental health struggles 
For a major news outlet to post this upon his death, I think is disgusting. This isn't just about Matthew Perry. It's about how people who are struggling are going to look at this and how they're going to feel. Surely we have come to a point in our society where we can have much more empathetic discussions, especially about addiction and mental health. And as somebody posted quite rightly, this is a disgusting way to frame mental health and addiction and a classless way to speak about someone who just died. And they then, after getting ripped to shreds, decided to delete the post. But, you know, the damage is already done. And no one knows this better than, you know, Harry and Meghan's friends. It must be absolutely exhausting to be Harry and Meghan's friends. Every single little thing that you post, or they try to use your name and say, Harry and Meghan's friend said this, Harry and Meghan's friend said that. So now we come to Jessica Mulrooney. So Jessica Mulrooney posted this um, picture of her, you know, father-in-law who once hosted Charles and Diana um, and uh, the Queen um, when he was Prime Minister of Canada. Now, mind you, these photos have probably been in the public domain for a while. Um, I don't know, maybe nobody in the British press just noticed and they decided, um, you know, after Jessica posted this picture of uh, Princess Diana um, and Charles with uh, Mila Mulrooney, they decided to make a whole story about how Meghan claimed she knew nothing about the royals. But here's Jessica posting, you know, a picture um, of her of her relatives. Now, you know, famous people or states people meeting other famous and states people happens um, all the time. I don't know what that has to do with Megan. Now, mind you, um, I, I don't know, uh, it's not really clear what the state of uh, Jessica and Megan's relationship is. Um, the way the press spin it, that they claim like they're not friends anymore. Um, we don't actually know that. But nonetheless, uh, the tabloid press are still trying to spin a negative story, grasping at straws. But hey, it's been what, seven years of this, is exactly what I expect from the tabloid press. Anywho, interesting story about Meghan's first speaking engagement as a working royal. So the article from Marie Claire says, thank goodness that Meghan walked into her career as a working royal with a background in acting. Otherwise, her first speech as a working royal could have gone off the rails. On the latest episode of Hello's A Right Royal Podcast, Invictus Games Foundation director David Wiseman admitted he accidentally delivered the wrong scripts for Meghan's first public address as Prince Harry's fiance, given back in 2018. The speech was given at the Endeavour Fund Awards, which Harry established to support the ambitions of wounded, injured and sick service personnel and veterans. But Megan struggled to start speaking because of a mistake. I messed up at work, Wiseman said of the incident. It was the first time she'd spoken in public as the future Duchess of Sussex. There weren't many of us at the Royal Foundation, so everyone sort of mucked in for everything. I was writing the script and there was a last minute request for a change from her team. Yeah, no problem, put it in. But she got the old version and the new version was sent to her co-host. My mate, British Army veteran Neil Heritage. And they were on stage and they had two different versions of the script. Oh my goodness. He added, I don't know if you remember, they were both sort of, not arguing, but saying, no, this is a version. And so there was a fluff of the lines in front of everyone on her first opening speech as the future Duchess of Sussex. He said, Wiseman joked that he died a little bit inside from his front row seat next to Harry, but was relieved as the two moved through the moment uh, and the event received positive press coverage. Wiseman later sent Harry apologetic texts about the mishap and Meghan hopped on the phone. Meghan jumped on the text. David, it's M. Honestly, really, really don't worry about it, Wiseman said. She was just so kind. People report that it was an unusual move for Meghan to present a prize that evening as she was not yet officially in the royal family, given her May wedding to Harry was still a few months away, the outlet reports. In contrast, Kate Middleton did not give her first speech until nearly a year after 
her royal wedding to Prince William. Oh, gosh. Well, there you go. A bit of a mishap. But David uh, Wiseman is now fully part of the um, Invictus team and the Sussex team and clearly doing a great job. You saw him dancing around with Team Nigeria at Invictus. Some of the squaddies managed to fi find him as well. I think he now has the nickname Invictus Bay. And you also saw him in the opening episode of the Invictus docuseries at Harry's home. So he's obviously not just somebody that works on their team, but also a close friend and confidant. So great to see amazing people around our face. Now, over in Kenya, Camilla and Charles are on a state visit, and a lot of people wondered whether or not he would give a formal apology for the actions of the British government and monarchy. So here's what he said, and you can decide whether or not this is an apology. He says, The wrongdoings of the past are a cause of the greatest sorrow and the deepest regret. They were aberrant and unjustifiable acts of violence committed against Kenyans as they waged, as you said at the United Nations, a painful struggle for independence and sovereignty. And for that, there can be no excuse. In coming back to Kenya, it matters greatly to me that I should deepen my own understanding of these wrongs and that I meet some of those whose lives and communities were so grievously affected. None of this can change the past, but by addressing our history with honesty and openness, we can perhaps demonstrate the strength of our friendship today. And in so doing, we can, I hope, continue to build an ever closer bond for the years ahead. As... Um, Jomo Kenyatta said, this is a former Kenyan Prime Minister, our children may learn about the heroes of the past. Our task is, our task is to make ourselves the architects of the future. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I would say that was an apology. I thought that was very, very carefully worded. Um, you know, he says that he wants to deepen his understandings of the wrongs. Well, you know, you could have done that a lot more closer to home with the one, you know, woman of colour in your family who is of African descent. And instead, you drove her out. And this actually reminded me of something that Harry said um, over a Zoom call when they were meeting with uh, some of the young Commonwealth representatives. And Harry actually said at that time, you know, we need to have uncomfortable conversations about the past. And when Harry said it, he was completely and utterly ripped to shreds in the papers the next day. These people have had all the time in the world to deepen their understandings of the wrongs, as Charles um, wants to put it here. And the two family members that tr tried to bring those conversations to the forefront you drove them away. So I don't believe that this is sincere at all. I think this is very carefully written by the palace courtiers, probably some government officials as well, because this is a state visit. And as usual, just empty words. Nothing has ever stopped either the monarchy or the British government from having more equitable relationships with former colonies. They just don't want to do it because they don't actually want to collaborate. What they want is to control. Now, in messy Middleton family news, is Uncle Gary writing a tell all book about the Sussexes? Let's get into this. I'm reading here from Celebrity, they say, For months now, I've been wondering why Gary Goldsmith hasn't been trotted out to explain why Carol Milton's business went bankrupt and why he can't withdraw some money to pay off party pieces' extensive debt. This is a good point, because especially when it comes to attacking the Sussexes, they always make sure to drag this guy out. He always has something to say, but all of a sudden he's gone very, very silent. Gary is Carol's brother and uncle to the Princess of Wales. Gary used to regularly give interviews to the Daily Fell, and he was usually tasked with hitting back at Prince Harry and Meghan. It was just in January of this year that Gary was at it again, smearing the Sussexes in the wake of Prince Harry's spare. The male truly paid him to put his name on the tabloid's most unhinged smear jobs for several years during the Sussexit. Some have theorised that Gary bankrolled the Middletons for years, that he was the one propping up party pieces and he was the one financing the great wait, Kate's 11-year wait for Big Blue. 
her wedding ring. That looks even more likely now that the Middletons' house of cards has collapsed and people are openly acknowledging that the Middletons have been broke for a while. Never forget, they did find a weed farm very, very close to where the Middletons lived and then that story just disappeared. There was never any updates on that and, you know, he's he's been known to be involved um, in kind of nefarious activities before. So this, I believe, is from... Oh, this is from The Mirror. So it says, A royal family insider has said that Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, are worried about a forthcoming bombshell memoir by um, Kate's uncle, Gary. Now, let me just stop right there. Sometimes when the press posts these stories, they're actually deflecting from something else. So could it be... And this is just the... Just a theory. Could it be that Gary is writing a memoir and perhaps he's the one who's writing the expose about the Middletons? Because he could very well be broke right now too. So he's also looking for money. And they would pay a pretty penny to get some exclusives about the Middletons and about um, the royals. Mind you, these people are willing to sell their souls to the devil for the bare minimum but he could definitely get a lot so it goes on to say um he's preparing to reveal private family details and will use this as an opportunity to give the middleton family a voice in the midst of accusations and criticisms leveled at the house of windsor by harry and Meghan. the source close to gary claims he's going to set the record straight in the form of a comeback account almost a year since the release of the Sussex's explosive tell-all Netflix docuseries. Oh dear. Mind you, um, Harry and Meghan don't actually talk about the Middletons in their documentary series at all. So what the hell is, is Uncle Gary even going to say? You know, Harry and Meghan have never spoken negatively about the Middletons. Meghan addressed the whole Meghan made me cry thing with Kate, but she did it in a very classy way. Harry's spoken about his brother and his family. So what the hell is Uncle Gary talking about? And what is he going to talk about? This is why I'm saying it, this story could just be a deflection from the fact that good old Uncle Gary could be writing his own expose about his own family. <laughs> Anyway, it goes on to say, although it is likely there will be some shock revelations released, Gary, who has made a £30 million fortune through his IT recruitment business, okay, so he does actually have a business? Interesting. We'll have Carol and Kate look over the manuscript before he gets passed to a publisher. They explain, Gary is still very close to both Carol and Kate. Oh, I'm sure he is, he's been bankrolling them. He won't want to do anything that will embarrass them. I mean, he's already done that. Wasn't he charged with... Um, yeah, he was charged with a misdemeanor. Um, anyway, Kaiser finishes off by saying, my theory is that Gary isn't writing anything and some male hack is planning to ghostwrite some ghastly smear job and Gary has agreed to put his name on it. I mean, that could also be true. Multiple things could be true. He might be writing a memoir and there could be some hack of the mail ghostwriting some ghastly smear job that Gary has agreed to put his name to. Wouldn't surprise me. My theory is that Gary is probably pretty broke too, like I said, considering we haven't heard anything about him riding to Carol's rescue. But even then, if he does have a company that big and if the company, you know, has actually made that much money, he would at least try to bankroll some of the, um, you know, the repayments, right? Money bags Gary can't help. Um, two different poster campaigns in Bucklebury. Neither of the wealthy son-in-laws will step in and the community is pissed off because Carrie, um, Carol sorry, basically defrauded Dozens of local businesses. What I've never understood about Uncle Gary is this. Every time he opens his mouth, it makes Middletons look absolutely unhinged. It's not the Sussexes who should be worried. It's Kate and William who should be worried that Kate's domestic abuser uncle is going to make everyone look tacky, crass, and low class. Well, um, they have more than done that themselves the last seven years anyway. So, you know, I, I don't know how much lower Uncle Gary can take these people. And with that, thank you so much for joining me for this new format of podcast. Um, if anything, it'll probably just make me condense the news down and, and make it more to the point. I hate the fact that I can't, you know, interact with you 
um, you know, live properly. And what I might also do now, I've literally just thought about this. Oh, what I might actually do is before lives, I might post on the community tab a list of all of the topics that we're going to discuss. And then you can leave your comments. Um, in the comment section of those posts and then I can actually read some of those out during the live because I do like uh, reading your comments and your feedback so it'll be kind of your chance to give your two cents and then where suitable when I do um, the pre-records I can screenshot those and put them in between um, the different stories as I'm relaying them because I really, I really do like a lot of the stuff that you will say and sometimes you remind me of things so I don't want to um, have that part missing from these podcasts as I do this new format, um, you know, while I'm somewhere where the internet isn't great. But thank you all so much for your support and for bearing with me. It is a little bit different, but I guess as long as I um, get the news to you and I appreciate you all for supporting. On your way out, please remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. We are racing towards 35,000 subscribers. Um, hit that like button. Let the algorithm know that we're here. Please do leave a comment. And if you want to donate, links in the description box as always. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, folks. I'm going to go join the rest of my day. Um, go sip some cocktails by a pool somewhere and just enjoy my birthday. Love you all. See you tomorrow. Ciao. If you would keep me waiting, I would wait a lifetime. In tricky situations, I will be a lifeline. To be fighting alone That's why I'm taking you home I never felt something like this before, I know Keep coming back for you time after time Maybe I'm losing my mind But I know I'll never leave you behind, no Baby, I got you When you feel like falling I'll be there to prove Yeah That baby, I got you No matter the distance No matter Baby, I got you When you feel like falling I'll be there to prove Yeah, yeah That baby, I got you No matter the distance No matter the hopes Yeah, yeah Baby, I got you In between us, still I feel your heartbeat mm -hmm. There's something about you, baby That makes me feel complete Nobody's meant to be fighting alone That's why I'm taking you home I never felt something like this before, I know Coming back for your time at the time Maybe I'm losing my mind But I know I'll never leave you behind, no Baby, I got you. When you feel like falling, I'll be there to 